Over 100 people gathered at Shtema Friday, December 6th to listen to Professor Eugene Kantorovich on the topic, Who is Afraid of the One-State Solution? This was part of a weekly lecture series in Shtema organized by Women in Green in order to safeguard and maintain a Jewish presence at the site. Shtema is located between Jerusalem and Gush Etzion. היום אנחנו נשמע את ההרצאה של פרופסור יוג'ין קונטורוביץ' ואנחנו מקווים שמההרצאה גם נקבל לא רק כוחות אלא גם טיעונים נכונים איך לפעול להכלת הריבונות. שבת שלום. It is our honor to invite Professor Eugene Kantorovich from Northwestern uh, uh, Univ Law University, member of the Forum Kohelet. Can I say that you and your dear wife made Aliyah, family made Aliyah, made Aliyah just a few months ago to Alan Schwut. Welcome home. Uh, thank you. It's a great honor to speak here. I think this is my first, uh, this is my first I think, public uh, speaking in Israel, and uh, it's very special. Uh, and it's an honor to be here at an event hosted by uh, the Women in Green uh, organization, which I have long admired and which does such extremely important work. So the title of the talk, Who is Afraid of the One State Solution? And maybe most of the people in the audience aren't afraid, but it's still important to know that most Israelis are probably afraid. Many people you know are probably afraid. They're not just afraid of the one-state solution, they're mortified. And the one-state solution has come to have a very important, a central role in the diplomatic process. It's the central argument in the diplomatic process. It used to be that negotiations with the Palestinians were supposed to be land for peace. Land for peace. That notion has almost completely disappeared. Nobody truly believes that giving up land will bring peace. So conveniently, a new argument has emerged. We need to give the Palestinians whatever they're asking for, because otherwise they will impose upon us a one-state solution. That's their weapon. Right? Worse, worse than bombs, they will impose a one-state solution. And this will, uh, this will reduce the Jewish majority in the, in the state of Israel. The one-state solution in discussions of the diplomatic process is referred to, it's discussed as if it's a nuclear bomb, a super ninja move that the Palestinians have, a gun they are holding to our heads. And this is explicitly the argument that people who favor uh, very generous uh, and dangerous, as they admit, concessions to the Palestinians, this is what the, the argument they make. This is the argument that Tzipi Livni makes. It's the argument that Barack Obama makes. You have to do this because the alternative is they will demand that they get to vote in Israel, they become citizens of Israel, a one-state solution, and that is a, a disaster. That, that, that is a disaster. This helps explain why the Palestinian demands are so great. If it's true, if it's true that the one-state solution is a gun that they are holding to our heads, then it would be very nice if they just ask for the 1949 armistice lines. That would be generous, because they have a gun to our heads. They could ask for more. And so, indeed, they do ask for more. Right? They ask, as of now, armistice lines plus right of return, linking Gaza uh, and Yehuda v'Shemron. They could ask for even more. And, indeed, one thing we see is if you believe that the one-state solution is a super-killer ninjutsu move that obliterates Jewish life here, really, we should be even more generous. What's so special about the 49 armistice lines? Uh, giving them almost everything, except Tel Aviv, would be better than this fatal one-state solution if it is believed to be fatal. So to the extent that Israeli decision makers internalize this belief that the Palestinians are about to spring this deadly one-state ninjutsu, ninjutsu on us, the Palestinian demands will only increase, and the scope of Israeli capitulation will only increase if it is ninjutsu. Now, again, this, this, I assume that the people who make this uh, one-state solution demographic catastrophe argument are making it sincerely. Some of them probably are not, because the people who most warn of the threat to a Jewish state from a 
a, a, a state with a Jewish identity from a one-state solution are also the ones who are uh, least interested in taking any other measures to preserve the Jewish character of the state, to do with migrants, uh, the role of religious law, etc. So the only measure many people seem to be interested in doing is the expulsion of Jews from their home, but there is a large bulk of the Israeli population that is genuinely concerned. What happens if the Palestinians get upset and say, we want one state, we'll be citizens like everyone else, and indeed, this, the Palestinian Authority has been threatening this forever. Uh, Abbas has been threatening to demand a, de de demand, de demand a one state solution for almost as long as he has been threatening to uh, resign, maybe longer. Um, okay, so, so that's who, who is afraid of the one state solution? Lots of Israelis, normal people, that's, that's who's currently afraid of the one state solution. Okay, who should be afraid? of the one-state solution. Who should be afraid? The Palestinians should be afraid of the one-state solution. For the Palestinians, the one-state solution, for us, the one-state solution, let's stipulate, would be costly, would be not free, would entail difficulties. For the Palestinians, it would be a catastrophe. It would be a disaster. It would be an impossibility, which is why they haven't done it. Now, Step back and just think about the bargaining dynamics. The Palestinians, they probably don't like us too much, and we're told that they have in their possession this absolutely killer ninjutsu move, which will be devastating for us and wonderful for them. So why haven't they used it yet? Are they just being nice? Are they being considerate? Uh, perhaps that move is not such dynamite for them uh, as, uh, as it would seem. The first thing we need to understand is that the notion that the Palestinians would ever truly embrace or call for or impose upon us this threat of demanding a one-state solution, we'll all vote together, we'll have one country, is a complete impossibility. And we have to consider what it, what it would take for that to happen. Basically, the, the notion that they would embrace the one-state solution is based on a myth, um, and a myth with amazing persistence, and that myth is that we are ruling over them and imposing upon them against their will. That we are subjecting them to our will. Now, if that were the case, if they were currently just pure subjects with no political rights, then surely being able to, to be a minority in a democratic Israel is better than just being totally disenfranchised people with no rights whatsoever. But that's not the current situation. That's not the current situation. They're not a disenfranchised people. As a matter of fact, they have their own government. And let's think of all the things they've gotten in the 20 years since Oslo. Let's think of all they've gotten. They have their own government. They have a sort of democratically elected leadership. Uh, they have a seat at the United Nations, and they've been recognized. Palestine. They just went to the United Nations. That I thought that people would at least stop worrying about the one-state solution as a threat that they could impose when they went and specifically got a state of Palestine recognized at the United Nations. They have their own state, they have diplomatic recognition, embassies across the world, they're treated like, uh, the heads of the Palestinian government are treated like dignitaries, heads of a country. They go around, they fly around, they have uh, diplomatic immunity, which they, they have sovereign immunity, which they inevitably invoke when they get sued for acts of terror in US courts. Uh, they have their own flags, they have their own central bank. They have their own TV stations, which produce different kind of programming that what would probably be produced if they were 40% of the population. They have uh, their own culture and their own institutions. They have, most particularly, their own civil service, which creates kind of uh, nominal jobs for a large portion of the, uh, of the young men. They have this bogus security force, which is uh, another source of employment. They receive huge amounts of money, billions of dollars from the Europeans, as just aid to support them. They have their own internet top-level domain name and their own internet country calling code. Okay, now what happens if they say, okay, one state, let's go. Okay, so let's take middle of the road estimates, they'd be 35 to 40% of the population. Is that a big change for us? That's a big change in Israel. Okay. Uh, maybe a, a, a doubling or a 60% increase in the size of the Arab population. But for them, it's an even bigger change. We go from, let's say, Arabs being 20% of the population to, let's say, 35% of the population. 
That's the, that's the bomb that they have. They go from being 100% of the decision makers in their own affairs to 35 or 40%. So that's a massive change. A massive change. And all of a sudden, so if they're 40%, could you imagine their schools continuing to be run? That is to say, Jews would still be the majority. There would be a different kind of curriculum, a different kind of culture. Their cherished rules against being able to sell land to Jews would, of course, have to go by the wayside. But most importantly, most importantly, the most basically, so far I've been kind of pretending like uh, it matters what regular Palestinians think. It doesn't because they don't have a democracy. So politically it doesn't really matter. From the point of view of the Palestinian leadership, they would go from being treated like leaders of a sort of country, flying around the world, handshakes in Europe, to being, a boss would go from being the head of a country, sort of, to being mayor of Ramallah. He would go from getting all this respect to being like the head of another faction in the Knesset, no one even knows who his name is, etc. And that's a boss. All the people under him, forget about it. What about the 40,000 people who get a paycheck for participating in the uh, nominal Palestinian security forces? Now they would have to do the, uh, the gibush for Givati if they want to, if they want to <laughs> parade around with a gun, and they're probably not going to be so successful. So for a lot of people's role in the world would be vastly degraded. Now, indeed, that explains why they have not yet demanded such a thing, because they find the status quo preferable. This would be mysterious if you think they have no government for themselves, we control all their affairs, we run their schools, we run their lives. Of course, that's not the case. So I assume, even if the Palestinians were 40% of the population, the laws of Israel would not be exactly like they are now, perhaps, but it would also be impossible that uh, criticizing a boss would be a crime that someone could be thrown in jail for. Presumably, presumably that they like having those kind of laws because they have them, uh, and we presume that this is a democratic society that they have. So that's going to be a very different society. They don't want that society. They really, they really don't want it. Here's the bottom one. We can live with Arabs. How do I know? Because we do. They can't live with Jews. How do we know? Because their demand, their singular demand, unique, by the way, in the history of all such peace negotiations, is not just an independent state, but a state completely cleansed of every last Jew, a demand which has not been made in any other context around the world. So we can live with Arabs. We prove it. They can't live with Jews. So they have a lot more to lose from this. A lot more to lose. So first thing, first thing to note, whether or not the one-state solution is a good idea, or whichever version of it is a good idea, currently we're like exactly in the backward situation where we are letting them threaten us and demand concessions based on something which is worse for them than it is for us. Much worse. Much worse. And again, you know, they do this a lot. This is very much like a boss resigning. He's threatening us with his own resignation. Uh, he, he, you know, he, uh, it's, it's not a, not a, not a realistic thing. That is, of all, who knows what's going to happen in the future? And whenever I listen to Nadia, I get very scared. But one thing I can guarantee is the Arabs living here will never say, "Let's have one big state where we all vote and just participate equally, and we're just another Palestinian minority like the Palestinian minority in Lebanon, Syria, etc." That's not what they want. They will never. It will never happen. Instead, we should be using the one-state solution as diplomatic leverage. Now, again, whether one thinks it's a good idea or not, and you should for sure tell this to your friends who don't think it's a good idea, from a, from a bargaining perspective, a credible threat of implementing a one-state solution is the clearly dominant strategy whether one thinks ultimately one should implement a one-state solution or give them some kind, agree to some kind of Palestinian statehood. Because the terms of the deal are going to be a lot better if we don't think we have a gun to our heads, but under which, and if they leave us just a little corner of Tel Aviv, we're better off than the alternative, it's much better off if indeed it's the reverse. Indeed, economists have this notion called revealed preferences. How do you know what people want? You look what they buy. People want what they buy. How do you know you want, they want what they buy? Because that's why they're buying it. Revealed preferences, right? The only way we can really know what people want is by what they do. 
The fact that Palestinians have neither imposed on us the one-state solution, an impossibility, nor taken repeated offers of actual independence, would suggest that maybe they don't want independence or, uh, or uh, the uh, one-state solution as much as they want some version of the status quo. Now, the status quo is problematic for us because we are actually blamed for indulging their revealed preferences. That is to say, they're not, giving, they're not asking for the one-state solution. They've rejected uh, independence, but it's, um, it's our fault. So it needs to be clear that uh, this is something they've um, agreed to. Uh, and how, how do you get them to agree to it? You say, listen, guys, if you don't give us what we want, we'll give you the one-state solution. And all of a sudden, the bargaining range broadens. Now, can you have, so here's the question, can you have, people say, it's impossible for a democratic country to have a territory that is under its sovereignty or dominion in some way, where the residents, where the residents do not participate fully in the political process of, um, of, of that country. So a, a situation in which the Palestinian territories have some kind of quasi-sovereignty, autonomy, whatever you want to call it, there's lots of shades of this in different uh, places in the world, one would have, to, uh, it would have to involve them voting in Israeli institutions. So there's a deep fallacy there. That's only the case if the presumption that Israelis get to vote on matters affecting Palestinians. Now, right, that's how it is in most countries. Right? So in most countries, if there's some territory where that becomes part of another country, those people get to vote, but then the metropolitan, the majority, get to vote for the minority as well. I assume that the Palestinians very much do not want that to happen. That they like to have their own schools run their own way. They don't want to send their boys, let alone their girls, uh, to Tzachal. So if, we don't get, if the majority does not get to determine what happens to the minority, conversely, that's a different, that's a different the, uh, conversely, the minority may not have the same rights of participation. Okay, let me give you some examples. This isn't just theory. Take Puerto Rico, for example. Puerto Rico is a part of the United States. It is under the sovereignty of the United States. The people who live in Puerto Rico, are Puerto Ricans, are citizens of the United States, full-fledged citizens. Yet, it is not a state of the United States. It is a territory. That's a very ambiguous constitutional structure, which was supposed to be temporary, and it has become permanent. Uh, it's become permanent. As a consequence of their territorial status, Puerto Ricans do not vote in federal elections. They don't vote for Congress, they don't vote for president. Now, the federal government has created incentives for them to uh, make them more comfortable with the situation. In particular, Puerto Rico enjoys a very special tax status. They have low taxes, this attracts lots of businesses. If they were to become a state like any other state, they would fall under uh, general federal uh, tax, or that would be, that would be uh, worse for them. Similarly, there are many other American possessions. Puerto Rico has more people than the Palestinian author uh, Authority in West Bank and Gaza. It has about four, mil four million people. Uh, there are many smaller places, each with several hundred thousand people. Guam, Samoa, Virgin Islands, which America pur purchased from Denmark about a hundred years ago. Uh, in none of those, those places, uh, they're part of the United States. And the people have complete local autonomy and do not vote in um, federal elections. Now, and this is not seen as an imposition necessarily because there's benefits, uh, there's benefits uh, for, for, the, for the people there. Similarly, by the way, I'm only mentioning democracies because well, obviously the people in Syria also don't get to vote and the people in Egypt <laughs> kind of get, get a right to vote. But, so the, presumably Israel would be held internationally to some uh, democratic standard. And there's uh, a whole list uh, of such places. Uh, for example, Britain. Right, so we're dealing with pretty nice countries so far. America, Britain. You might have heard of some places, Bermuda, Cayman Islands, the Falkland Islands, which, whose sovereignty is disputed. Gibraltar whose sovereignty is disputed. All of those places are, they're each, many of them have unique, different kinds of re legal regimes, different degrees of autonomy. In none of those cases 
Do the people vote for parliament? Remember the American Revolution, no taxation without representation? So it has not reached these places, and it's thought to be okay. Now, one might say, look, but those cases are different because the people there don't mind. Now, it's a question what don't mind means. If a country administers a place, democratizes it, etc., and then 40 years later asks the people, do you mind? They may well not mind. So asking the Palestinians whether they mind now, it's kind of like asking the Soviets and a Soviet citizen in 1980, who do you want to be president? You can't really, you can't speak freely. Uh, but they are also the notion that they don't mind is a little bit disingenuous. Just last year in 2012, Puerto Rico had a referendum on whether to continue their territorial status, whether the 54% of Puerto Ricans voted against the territorial status. That news was met at the White House and in the United States with a big yawn, and with the response, we didn't allow this referendum, we didn't endorse this referendum, who said they can have a referendum, uh, and maybe in a few years, we'll organize a new referendum. By the way, the Puerto Ricans in the referendum, they did not vote as a majority for independence, and they did not vote as a majority either for statehood, because they were given three options, and the winning option needs a majority vote, which you can always construct a kind of vote like that to uh, prevent any change in the status quo by introducing three options and a requirement of an, abs of an absolute majority. So the Puerto Ricans just last year, Puerto Ricans who, by the way, like all these other places I mentioned, are listed by UN, the UN as colonies, they voted, we don't like this, we don't like this. But um, apparently it's okay. Now, again, I, I cite these other precedents with, uh, with, with caution because it's, it's false to assume as a political matter. So I cite these examples simply to uh, respond to the contention. If Israel uh, has sovereignty in the sense of defense and foreign policy control over the territories, but the Palestinians have their own government and Israel has its own government, democratic states can't do that, that's racist, apartheid, whatever. So that seems not to be the case. Now again, I wouldn't count on these examples as precedents because it's generally known that uh, what works for other countries is not allowed to work for Israel. Israel is not allowed to do what other countries do. But, so, so that's an objection to my examples. And I agree that's a very strong objection. It's almost entirely the, certain that if Israel were to publicly cite these examples, people say, well, Israel is different, this is different, it's worse, you're bad, we're good. Um, <laughs> but, but that cuts both ways. That is to say, it's true that Israel is not allowed to do what other countries do, what other democratic countries do, but that also goes both ways. If there were, for example, a two-state solution, if Israel retreated to the 1949 armistice lines, it is also a mistake to think that Israel would be allowed to do what other countries do, vigorously defend itself, respond with overwhelming force, as America does, protect its borders. So, so that cuts both ways. That's a, that's a, ge uh, a general problem. So these arrangements exist. By the way, these arrangements, the Puerto Rican arrangement, it seems to me, he never cited it explicitly, but it seems to me what, uh, most clearly consistent with the vision of, uh, of uh, arrangement with the Palestinians described by Yitzhak Rabin. So in, in his various descriptions of what he saw the end game as being, it actually sounds uh, a lot like uh, the arrangement between the United States and Puerto Rico, certainly not an uh, independent, uh, independent state. So in other words, whether one likes uh, a one-state uh, one solution or not, whether one thinks that's a good idea, it's certainly a good idea not to run around like chickens with our heads cut off at the mention of a one-state solution. Indeed, we should experiment doing the other thing. We should say, hey, Palestinians, if you don't cut a deal with us that's acceptable to us, we'll implement a one-state solution. There are things we can do now to make that threat more credible. That is to say, it only works if it's credible. There are certain things that would make that threat credible, things which would mitigate, to a certain extent, to Israel, the, um, the costs of a one-state of a, uh, of a one solution. Uh, all of these things are independently good ideas. These are things I favor for completely different reasons, for independent reasons. They would also help Israel in a diplomatic context more credibly threaten the imposition of a, of a, of a, a one-state solution, which may be a good idea in any case. So, for example, 
the Palestinians, Abbas said in 2008, we will demand to be citizens just like every other citizen with all the privileges of Israeli citizenship. So one of the greatest privileges of Israeli citizenship is uh, service in Tzahal. Uh, it's one of the greatest privileges. Ah, so, okay, precisely. That's a problem. That's a problem. One thing, it's a problem independently, and it's a problem for this reason. So Arabs and Israelis don't. They're currently 20% of the population. If they're 40% of the population, it's just in, untenable to have an ex ex exemption of that kind. But in general, even some Jews don't. Those exemptions need to be eliminated, and it needs to be made clear what Israeli citizenship means. What Israeli is three years of army service for men, and if you really want to scare the Palestinians about a one-state solution, two years for women, no <laughs> religious exemptions. That may be uncomfortable and costly to many Jews who don't think it's a good idea, but it may be well worth the, uh, well, well worth the price. Again, these are not things that we're making up to impose on the Palestinians. We do believe in three years of army service for men. It is a great value. It is a great thing. But the stakes are even higher when we think about how seriously to administer and enforce these laws and what exemptions to allow. The stakes are higher than we imagine when we think about it as uh, just an issue concerning uh, Haredim or, uh, or Israeli, uh, Israeli Arabs. Um, So the draft is something that should be uh, insisted on. Uh, absentee voting. Absentee voting. It's v Most democratic countries have some version of absentee voting. There are maybe half a million Israelis living abroad. Now, people have also have strong feelings about this. But there's, all, there's various forms and strains of absentee voting. One could imagine allowing absentee voting for the first 10 years that someone is abroad. All these things would greatly mitigate the sc allegedly scary effects of a uh, one-state solution. Similarly, an elimination of proportional representation. Proportional representation is the system of vote counting that creates the Knesset. So if you get 5% of the votes, you get like 5% of the seats, roughly speaking. As opposed to America, which is a first-past-the-post system. For, that means you get 51% of the vote, you're, you're in business. Uh, first-past-the-post systems generally create much more centrist political parties and moderate any extreme factions that may exist within, uh, within parties. Also, geographic representation. It's another good idea. These are all things that are, that are very good, but if we were to do them, these are not things that I would favor just to make life difficult for the uh, Arabs. God forbid these are inherently good ideas. Taking them seriously, though, does show a kind of genuine, uh, a genuine willingness about proceeding, um, about proceeding uh, with sovereignty over, over the area. So, Finally, let me just address uh, the demographic question. So well, a, a, a major argument against uh, any kind of one-state solution is even if the Palestinians will only be 40% at first, eventually the Arabs between the river and the sea will be 51%, and then, and then that's bad. Um, that's bad. That's, so that's, that's the idea. Who knows what's going to happen in the future? I, I have... I have no insight. Uh, however, if it is true, if these negative assumptions are correct, these negative assumptions are based on the Arab fertility rate not continuing to go down and the Jewish fertility rate starting to go down. So if that happens, and the Arabs ever become a majority between the river and the sea, that's probably going to be a disaster whether there's a two-state solution or a one-state solution. Because if there's a two-state solution and the Arabs begin to considerably outnumber the Jews between the river and the sea, they will be able to exert all sorts of demographic pressures, uh, demands for autonomy in areas where there are a considerable majority, in the Negev between Gaza and, uh, uh, and between the two parts of the new Palestinian state, in the Triangle, there'll be, people will say, this Jewish state, it's not fair. They got so much land and the Arabs, there's so many of them. And there'll be new demands. Now, the notion that there can never be new demands is false. There have been new demands in the past. 
In the 1950s, America continuously insisted that Israel give up the Negev for peace. So this notion that uh, the Negev is somehow sacred is not true. Uh, when Serbia gave up all its various constituent parts, it thought it was safe. But then Albanians and Kosovo, began, which was never considered to not be part of Serbia, began making demands. So in the end, yes, if the demographic tide goes against the Jews, that will be bad news either way. Uh, and on the other hand, if it doesn't go against the Jews, boy, would we feel stupid if, God forbid, we gave up uh, half the country. 